Happy Sabbath, church. Can we all stand for the call to worship? Call to worship is going to be from Psalms 18, so various, various uh, verses. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, <clears throat> for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Verse 5, I called on the Lord in distress. How many of you called on the Lord this week in distress? And, what, and the Lord answered me, and he set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Verse 8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Verse 14, the Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Verse 21, I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. Verse 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and for your grace. On this day, where it's starting to get cold and it's dreary and it's rainy, we could complain, but we just have too much to be thankful for. The truth is we need the rain in our tanks. And so today we just want this to be a celebration. We are here because of you and because of your refusal to give up on us. So bless this service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
sing our opening hymn is I've Got That Old Time Religion. So you're already sending, so that's a good thing. And if you have the old time religion and feel the need to come and give an extra thanks or appreciation to God, I invite you to come to the altar. 
if you have a need, whether it be one of sickness or finance or whatever your need is, you, there is room at the cross. Please come and present it to God, our Father. Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Joy. Joy comes in the morning. Know that God. kneel reverently loving God our Father in heaven God and Father of our Savior Jesus Christ we come humbly into your presence into your sanctuary this Sabbath morning because Lord this is a time a holy time that you set aside for this purpose where we should come and gather to worship you to say thank you Lord for keeping us through the past six days of toil and labor. You set this side as time aside, Lord, where we can come and tabernacle with you to get rid of, to lay aside the burdens of life, the burdens of work. And so we come and empty ourselves unto you, O God. We recognize, God, that you are our maker, our creator, and provider, our sustainer and redeemer in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you. Father, we Recognize that sin has separated us from you, even as your son Jesus Christ was separated from you when he took on our sins. And so this morning, Lord, as we come into your presence, we ask, forgive us where we have come short of your glory because of sin. We still come short each day, so we empty ourselves unto you. Father, there are those who have come to the altar because they come with an extra thanksgiving I pray, Lord, that you will hear the prayers of their heart. Some have come because of illnesses of loved ones, and we pray, Lord, that you will hear their requests too, even though they ver verbalize them quietly. We pray that you will hear them, and we know that if you hear, Lord, you will answer their prayer. We pray for those who are ill and unable to be here. They are in the hospital. They are at home. They are in uh, various nursing homes, Lord. We ask that you will extend your thought your thought of healing towards them, Lord, because we know that you don't have to physically go there. You continue to heal sick people here on this earth, even though you are billions of miles away. Yet you can come near in a moment of time. We thank you. We pray, Lord, for those who are mourning because they have lost loved ones. Lord, it is part of this life that sin has caused, and we pray this morning that you will bring comfort and peace to them, that they will be able to deal with the loss, the separation from their loved ones. Pray, Lord, that the separation is only for a short time. We ask, dear Father, that you will be with our seniors who are unable to come out. And those who are here, Lord, we pray a special blessing for them. We pray also, Lord, for the leadership of this church, that we will respect you, Lord, enough to lead in your Holy Spirit's direction and according to your word. 
We pray, dear Father, that your anointing be upon the pastor to give him wisdom and to give him understanding, not just as he present the word from you today, Lord, but is in his daily administration of this church. Lord, we know that you hold each and every one of us accountable. And so we pray, dear Father, that on this worship today, it will glorify and honor you. May your Holy Spirit pour out in um, copious measure and each participant here today, the elders, deacons, deaconess, the choir and praise team, may we all worship and glorify you and Jesus Christ, your son, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, it's a happy day. And that's what I'm going to say. Song says, oh, happy day. When Jesus washed my sins away, he taught me how to pray because it's a happy day. Day. Oh, a happy day when Jesus was. Well, when Jesus was. Oh, when Jesus was, he washed my sins away. A happy day. Happy day, oh a happy day, when Jesus washed, oh when he washed, when Jesus washed, he washed them all.
My God, he's a good God, yes he is. And he showed me how to live. He showed me how to live, live, live. Every day. My God, he's a good God, yes he is. Oh, 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 yeah. oh a happy day. Oh, a happy day when Jesus was. Oh, when he was. When my Jesus was, he was my sins all away. He took them all away. It's gonna be a happy day. Can't wait to get there. Can't wait to see his face. It's a happy day. Huh. Come on. It's gonna be a happy day. Hey. When I get to heaven, gonna sing and shout it all. Put on my own white robe, walk on streets of gold. When I get to heaven, gonna see my Jesus this. Put on my own white robe, oh, a happy day. to welcome you to the Hamilton Seven Day Adventist Church where worship is a and the love is and you have already felt that love I am sure and so I just want you to encourage you to continue to praise God to clap your hands to sing and even to dance I want to encourage you even to dance. As the Spirit of God moves upon your heart, you let Him encourage you to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And we hope today that the love of God will bless your heart, that when you leave this place, you'll be able to share it with someone else. Welcome. Oh, boy. Amen. Amen. I agree with most of <laughs> uh, what a blessing it is to be here. We wish to welcome you again to the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church, where worship is a joy and the love is real. It is our prayer that as you worship to us with us today that the peace of God and the presence of God, the persistence of God will make guerrilla incursions on your heart, that you might be persuaded by the passionate love, the precious promises, and the pulchritude in his heart of the man 
we call Jesus Christ. We are blessed to be here in his presence. And one of the first things, well, first of all, we got some special guests here with us today. I wish to acknowledge uh, a family that's still in bereavement, that of the Holder and the Anderson family that has chosen to worship with us today. God bless you. Uh, it's good to have you with us. Uh, we're sad that this keeps happening, but we look forward to the day. We look forward to a day uh, where there'll be no more suffering, no more sickness. I'm, I shared yesterday, just did another funeral, and those of you may or may not know, uh, yesterday we laid to rest another faithful member of this church. Hasn't been around here, I think, for a while, but she is a very faithful member of this church, and that of Sister Hazel Holder. And we laid her to rest uh, yesterday, and I expressed then, if I expressed several times these last few months, I'm, I'm tired of funerals. I'm looking for the day when we will have no more funerals. You know, I told him yesterday, I'm looking to the day, you know, when, when, when Amos and Augustus are broke, <laughs> sitting in glory broke, huh? No money to earn, no nothing, because Jesus has already redeemed his righteous and brought him back home. Amen? So we look forward to that day, but we grieve with you, family, today. Uh, as you miss your uh, dear loved one. The Bible lets us know, Isaiah 8, verse 20, those slides should be there. Isaiah 8, uh, verse 20, the Bible says what, church? To the law, and what? To the testimony, the first slide, if they speak not of what? According to this word, there is what? No light in them. Philippians 4, verse 13, what does the Bible say? I can do all things through who? Through Christ, which what? which strengthens me. We want to encourage you to come on out to prayer. I mean, this month, we are discussing faith and works. Faith and works. And we're understanding that concept this month. So come on out and be a part of that special time. Next slide. Next slide, if you would. Yes, we want to remind you, this is Square Up With God Quarter. Uh, some of you uh, know that you have been using God's money for other purposes this year. And so now is that time that you were planning to make it right with him. Can the church say Amen. And so we're looking for you to step out and to make things right with him this quarter. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, next up we have I Search This Afternoon, 4.30. Uh, Elder Burgess will be dealing with church history again. Church history. Yeah, I think he's here somewhere. Yeah, he'll be dealing with church history again. And we want to invite you to come on out and be a part of that program. Next up. Yes, pre-K, kindergarten is having open house at Bermuda Institute on November the 21st from 10 to 12 noon. If you are interested in sending your children or grandchildren and getting them involved in pre-K or K at Bermuda Institute, you want to go ahead and get in there on November the 21st from 10 to 12 noon. I want to let you know that we have two amazing teachers in both the pre-K and in the kindergarten, two wonderful teachers. We just want to ask if you are just Go up there and check it out, and I believe you will be blessed and your children will be blessed as our children should be taught of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, yes, November 23rd will be our Praise and Testimony Sabbath. Our Praise and Testimony Sabbath will be uh, on November the 23rd. Uh, the speakers, we, as we did last time, we have three speakers that will go this time back to back. Uh, the Honorable Wayne Keynes, Dr. Stanley James, and then I will conclude that message on this coming uh, November 23rd. Of course, the service will change up. We're going to have testimony time. We're going to have praise time. The, I'll get with my minister of music and make sure we have that service uh, just in a special way, a time for us to come and give real thanksgiving to God for bringing us. Can you believe another year has passed by, church? Another year has gone just that quickly. Uh, it's amazing. I still feel like I got here yesterday, and two years are gone already. So come on out and be blessed. We're going to have a wonderful time together. Next up, yes, today we have two, uh, two Sabbath birthdays. Uh, my aunt Sybil, Sybil Trott, who just lost her sister. We just laid her sister to rest yesterday. Uh, and Eulene Wilkinson is also celebrating a Sabbath, sorry, Okay, cool. That's what's in the bulletin. Uh, Eulene Furbitt, she recently got married. She recently got married. Yeah, so. Three years. <laughs> Two, three years ago, she got married. <laughs> I'm, looking at, 
I'm looking at, I'm looking at my administrative assistant as to why it's still Wilkinson in the bulletin, but uh, her name is Yulene Ferbert, am I right? Yeah. Okay, well, we, we're happy for Yulene Ferbert, and we want to wish her a happy honeymoon, and we want to wish her uh, just a wonderful time <laughs> uh, in the Lord. Next slide, next slide, next slide. Yes, it's that time. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Let's get on our feet. Our praise team can make their way down here behind me. But let us stand to our feet, everyone. Let's stand to our feet. Repeat after me this morning. Say, there's no place. Come on, I can't hear you. There's no place like this place, anywhere near this place. So this must be the place, man. Come on, look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I just want to see you smile because you're in the right place. Come on, shake your neighbor's hand. Tell them that you love them today. Tell them it's good to be here in the house of the Lord. And we're going to sing an amazing song, a song that touches our hearts, a song that means the world to us, a song that speaks deep into our hearts, a song. It's a great day. Today. It's a great day. It's a great day. It's a great day. It's a great day. <laughs>
praise the Lord. As the children come down for their children's story, we're going to sing. A... Yes, the, yes, the, the love is a flag. Hallelujah. The, lo the flag is flown high. Praise the Lord. Come on, children. Big boys and girls still walking around. Oh. everybody now I'm here now you know what I like excitement I like exciting things I like doing exciting things that's Good exciting morning, that's excitement church. <laughs> our scripture reading is from Luke chapter 1 verse 37 for with 
God, nothing is impossible. Amen. And I hope you forgive me for taking your spot, my brother. All right? That was good, man. Yes, that was good. Yeah, don't blame it on my heart. I'm brand new. I'm brand new. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but you know what? I like exciting things. How many of us like to do exciting things? Like not boring, drabby things, like really exciting things. Because you know what? I learned a long time ago that I kind of learned different. You know what? It's so exciting. I got to take my sweat off because I'm going to get hot telling this story. <laughs> this story is going to be nice. Oh. oh, yeah. Every time I tell this story, I start sweating. <laughs> Amen. But first, let me read this scripture to you because this stood out to me. And it says in 1 first, in first Corinthians chapter 9. Chapter 9, starting from verse 24, it says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, that you can get the prize. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it for a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now, boys and girls, I like the idea of a race because, as you all know, I like bikes. Remember that? I told you I like bikes before, and I love to race, or at least I did. I'm a little old now, but I still love racing, right? And you know what? God chose the craziest thing to start teaching me a lesson about race, about how it is to be in this Christian race. And you know what, boys and girls? I'm going to share a story with you because one time I got an opportunity to race in Canada. That's right. And I got everything ready. I got down on my knees and I prayed. I said, Lord, these brothers are about to go to Canada. And you know, I want to go. So, Lord, make a way. I had to find money to pay to get my bike shipped over there. And my dad was my mechanic and my family to go with me. And I had all my gear. And I said, yep, I'm going to race in Canada. This is going to be awesome. Such a huge track. I mean, speed's unfathomable to the mind. You know, that type of thing. Not like it is in Bermuda where we just do like 100, 100 miles per hour. Oh, no, I want to go way past that. Right? And so anyway, I got these things together, and we shipped all our, our bikes in a container, and we, off we went to Canada. And I prayed. I said, God, please protect me and help me to do well, to enjoy this experience. You've allowed me to come. Be with me. And anyway, the day came. We got to go on the track to practice. And true to my form, you know, I don't really know the track that well, but I can't go slow. So I said, well, I'll just learn it on the fly. And I put my hand to the throttle, and off I went. And I put a couple of laps. It was really nice. I, okay, I had a few mistakes and this and that. And then I came back into my dad. I said, the bike's too slow. She's only doing about 110. I said, fix it. He fixed it. I went back out. Ah, oh, and it was much better. But I came back in, and I said, still too slow. And I went back out, and I did it again. I came back. I said, Daddy, the bike is too slow. Let's make this thing faster. This is a big track. Finally, I got that bike up to about 130 miles per hour. That's right, not kilometers, miles per hour, right? And I remember, I said, this is it, my last practice on the track. I'm going to get this thing down. And I remember coming onto this back straightaway, and I mean, I was leaned over like this, and the throttle was down wide open, and I hit the straightaway, and the bike got up to about 130 miles per hour. Now, at the end of this straightaway was a very sharp turn that went uphill. And I looked down the end of the straightaway, and I saw a gentleman going around the corner like lollygagging, like this was time to play or something. It wasn't time to play. This was race time, right? So anyway, as I come to, I was going so fast that after the second I saw him, the next second, I was on him. I had made the turn, and he was just, la, 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 la. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, he's probably going to go to the inside of the track, so I'll go to the outside. And when I attempted to go to the outside, lo and behold, 
he turned to the outside. And at about 120 miles per hour, because I had to break down just a little bit to make that turn, at about 120 miles per hour, I had to straighten up and go off the track onto the grass. And I mean, I was moving. And that bike was going across the grass like this. And on the other side of the grass was nothing but forest, huge trees. And the grass was flat. It was cut in a straight line right across. And little did I know that there was an actual ditch in that grass. And I thought I had it. I said, all right, this is pretty good. I'm getting it. I'm bringing my bike around. Because you can't ride on the grass on those bikes. They will just slide. So I slowly brought it around, brought it around, brought it around. And boom, I hit this ditch. And I went in the air. I went one way. And the bike went the other way. And while I was in the air flying, waving to the world goodbye, I said, Lord, this has got to be it. And I went through the trees. And when I gained my, my, my consciousness, I guess you could say, I was on the ground, laying there, and it was quiet. And I just sort of felt myself like, I'm still here. <laughs> and I rode over slowly, and I looked up to the sky, and I started to pray. I said, Jesus, thank you. I never hit a tree. <laughs> and then the Spirit spoke to me. I don't know if you've ever heard God speak to you, but I heard him speak to me. And he said, look behind you. And I rode up and I looked behind me like this. And what did I see but a metal stake? It made a hole about this big in my leathers. And it was just touching my back. And the Lord said, if you were going any faster, you wouldn't be here. And I got up. The ambulance people came. My dad came a running. And they put me on this gurney. And you know what? I felt kind of fine, but then I said, well, what about my bike? <laughs> and, you know, the bike went down between the trees all by itself. And guess what? That bike maneuvered through the tree. Well, I know what did it. God made that bike maneuver through the trees. It never hit a tree. And finally, it came to a stop boop, and leaned against the tree. <laughs> I mean, that was so amazing. Anyway... I went in the ambulance, and when I came out of the ambulance, they checked me up. I felt fine. When I came out, I took one step onto the ground, and I buckled. Boom! I realized I couldn't walk. And guess what? Some of all the guys I was racing with, ah, uh, they were scared of me racing with them because they knew I'd probably just beat them, right? <laughs> so they started laughing at me and said, oh, I guess you're not racing on Sunday. Because guess what? I never go to the track on the Sabbath. Even though everybody else does, I just spend Sabbath in church. And I said, I spent Sabbath in, I went to the hospital. They put me in a motorized wheelchair, and I could not walk. And I said, God, you have not allowed me to come all this way just to end it like this. And all day Sabbath, while everybody was at the track having a great time, I was in my hotel room praying and I prayed literally all day I said Lord heal my foot so I can go in this race on Sunday heal my foot Lord heal it and guess what by the end of the Sabbath I still couldn't walk <laughs> I still couldn't walk and that night I went to sleep I couldn't walk I got up somehow in the morning to use the bathroom, and this is how I went to the bathroom, like this. I still couldn't walk, and I kept praying and praying. I said, Lord, I know you can heal my foot. And the next morning, when I woke up, race day, race time, I woke up. And when I woke up, I leaned on the side of the bed. I said, Lord, this is it. I trust you. And I got up out that bed, and I walked. I said, Dad, let's go. We're going to the track. We're going to the track, but you know something? 
It was such a miracle that when I walked into the track, everybody turned. How did that happen? And I smiled and I said, you know what? Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. And this last thing I'm going to tell you about this exciting story is I said, okay, God, now that I'm here, I couldn't ride on Sabbath, but I'm still on the track on Sunday. So I'm going to say, God, I'm way down the back in the grid. So I'm way at the back when everybody else is at the front. I said, Lord, I'm going to give the throttle on this bike, and I'm going to go through the gears on this bike, and I'm going straight down the middle. Clear my path. <laughs> That's a real thing. I said, Lord, I'm going straight down the middle. And I want to get at least up to 10th place. I really should have asked in first place because guess what happened? When the light went green, I went, ah! and I went straight down the middle. Almost like close my eyes, like, get out of my way, get out of my way. I'm coming. I'm coming through. And God allowed me. And by the time I hit the first turn, guess what position I was in? 10th place. And I said, what a fool. I should have asked him to take me up to first place. He gave me exactly what I asked for. So, boys and girls, I want you guys to understand something. No matter what you do, God cares about you. And you can believe he can do miracles and he can do what you ask him to do. All right? Can you guys do that? You guys are going to trust him from now on? You remember, I trusted him at 130 miles per hour. Surely you can trust him when you're running. All right? So let's, anybody want to have prayer? Yes, come and have prayer. <laughs> He's going to take the prayer time since I took his scripture time. Dear God, dear Father, bless us, help, keep us safe, and help us worship you today. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for listening, boys and girls. Hopefully one day I'll have another exciting story for you, because I have a lot. All right? Amen. You can quietly go back to your seats. Thanks again. thing Elder Smith told us is that we need to trust in God. Yeah. All right. Well, here's another time when we need to show our trust in God. In fact, listen carefully to this. In 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 15, it shows that there is a relationship between sowing and reaping. I know you've seen many gardens in Bermuda, and you have not seen one garden. And I'm not talking about your little garden at home. I'm talking about those real big gardens that we have here. You haven't seen not one garden that has only maybe one stalk of corn, right? You see a field, a whole field of corn. So there is a relationship between sowing and reaping. A good farmer does not sow grudgingly, that would be one corn, nor does he sow sparingly, but he sows cheerfully and bountifully. Why? Because he knows that there is a relationship between sowing and harvest. When he sows, he sows much more than he anticipates harvesting because he knows that some of it is going to go by the wayside, maybe. Some of it just might not grow. Bountifully, the, the text says, reveals the elevated and divine nature of Christian liberality. Christian giving, just like God's gift in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, is not really a sacrifice. We look at Christ, Christ dying on the cross as a sacrifice, but it's not really a sacrifice but rather it is a preparation, or it was a preparation for a harvest. When Jesus died on the cross, he died in preparation of a harvest. I'm going somewhere with this, with the call for the offering and, and the time. 
Christ gave to harvest. Keep that in mind. Christ gave to harvest. Giving and harvest goes together. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Now, let's talk a bit more about this giving and harvest thing. In Isaiah 53, verse 11, Jesus said he saw the result of his passion, that is, his death, and he was satisfied. Jesus saw the result. He saw the harvest of his passion, of his death, and he was satisfied. When Christ died, he saw the result. He saw the harvest. He saw you and me. He saw all of us in heaven for eternity, and that satisfied him. In the plan of salvation, God demonstrated the way to sow, and he guarantees the harvest. Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25 says, It is possible to give away and become richer. Many times we hold on to it. It is also possible to hold on too tightly and to lose everything. Yes, the liberal man shall be rich. By watering others, he waters himself. Amen. Let's let the uh, deaconess and the deacons come forward. Uh, to receive the tithe and the offering, and let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the opportunity that we can have to share in your harvest. We understand that by giving, we're actually giving towards the harvest. Help us to understand that concept, and every time we return the tithe, every time we give an offering, help us to understand that we are giving because we are sowing for harvest. Bless our giving, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I look back over my life, I can see how your love has guided me. Even though I've done wrong, you never left me alone, but you forgave me and you kept on blessing. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It's because of your mercies that will be enough consumed. Because thy compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Toward what lies ahead, I'm assured that you will guide and comfort me. Everything you have promised, you're able to perform. I've learned to trust you, for you have always come through. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It's because of your mercy that we are not consumed because thy compassions fail not they are new every morning great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness
what you've done for me How you loose my shackles and you set me free How you made a way out of no way Turn my darkness into day You've been my joy in the time of sorrow Hope for my tomorrow Peace in the time of storm Strength when I'm weak and worn I can never repay you, Lord, what you've done for me You all look so sweet like sugar. So we're going to talk about sugar today. <laughs> Scientists have listed over 100 reasons why sugar consumption is harmful for our bodies when eating or taking too much. I'm only going to give you 21. It suppresses the immune system. It upsets the mineral relationships in the body. It causes hyperactivity, anxiety, difficulty concentrating, and crankiness in children, and in some adults. Rises triglycerides, contributes to reduction of defense against bacterial infection, causes loss of tissue elasticity in your skin, reduces high density lipoproteins, it leads to chromium deficiency, it also leads to cancer of the um, breast, ovaries, prostate, and rectum. It increases um, fasting levels of your glucose, it causes copper deficiency. It interferes with absorption of the calcium and magnesium. It weakens your eyesight. It rises the level of the neurotransition, the dopamine, serotonin, and the norepinephrine. Can, yeah, can cause hypoglycemia, can cause an acidic digestive tract. It causes arthritis, causes heart, heart diseases, asthma, gallstones, varicose veins. Why would we want sugar? If you want to see the whole complete list, I actually got this out of my book, The Natural Remedies Encyclopedia, the seventh edition. And it's written by Vance Farrell and Harold Chern. So if anyone wants to um, read the whole entire list. Um, Sister White told us in Councils on Health, I'm sorry, Diet and Foods, on chapter 19. I'm just going to give you a little snippet. Point 0.525, this talks about sugar. Sugar is not good for the stomach. It causes fermentation, and this clouds the brain and brings peevish into the um, disposition. Point 526, cakes, sweet puddings, pastries, jellies, jams, and active causes, all the things we love, isn't it? Causes indigestion. Especially harmful are the custards and puddings in which milk, 
eggs, and sugar are the um, chief ingredients. The free use of milk and sugar taken together should be avoided. Sugar clogs the system. The rest of the point on point 527 simply says to us that we should learn the art of cooking and how to replace the sugars. Sugar can do more harm to the body than meat, which I just read to you. These changes should be made cautiously and the subject should be treated in a manner not calculated to disgust or prejudice those whom we would teach and help. Point 528, no matter how much we like our sweets, we should watch what we eat, because why? This is the temple of God, and we are God's property. We must educate our appetites. It's not easy to do so on your own. First try fasting and asking our Father to take away our cravings for the sweet things in life. You would be surprised how plain or simple foods prepared can taste so good. What we can use instead of sweet, um, the sugars, we can use honey, agave, blackstrap molasses, pure cane sugar, to name a few. For further reading on sugar, read some of Sister White's readings on health for living, councils on diet and health, and ministry of healing. Have a blessed Sabbath. Stay sweet. Amen to that again. We got to pull back away from the dessert table. <laughs> Our scripture reading for this morning, uh, this afternoon, is taken from Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 through 12. I'll read in your hearing. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto the dead. Hearing this, the reading of God's word, may we be warned because our accuser has been cast down to us. Amen. Amen. Good morning again and happy Sabbath. Oh, that was tired. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Amen. Praise God for the Sabbath. It's a blessed Sabbath. It is, and it is, good. it is afternoon time. You are, you are correct. I want to just thank God for waking us up this morning and bringing us here in the rain, in the cold. But we are here. And if you're here, that means you are alive. That means you're breathing. Okay? So we just have to at least thank God for that alone, for having the opportunity to be here in his sanctuary. I want you to envision with me yourself in heaven. And we made it through and we're excited and we're looking at God and worshiping him and thanking him and bowing down before him. And the angels of God are there and all of heaven is there and we're singing hallelujah to the Lamb of God. God, we worship you. Lord, we praise you. We give you all the glory and the honor. Salvation and glory belongs to you. As we sing these next two songs, envision yourself in heaven, worshiping a God that wakes you up each morning, a God that brings you through trials and tribulations. Even when we don't even feel like standing here before you, we give him praise. We worship him in spirit and in truth. Why don't you worship with us this morning? Amen. Everybody say Hallelujah Salvation Salvation and glory Honor Honor and power Unto the Lord
honor and power. Honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our yes, God. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God. The Lord our God. For all the altos in. If you could stand to your feet and sing this part. time all praises my shepherd I shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures he he goes before me he's the defender behind me I have nothing to fear because he won't leave me I'm not alone you are not alone he is your comforter he's here to hold you up the song and the words say the Lord is my shepherd goes before me. If you know the song, please feel free to sing out and join with us as we continue this worship experience. Sing with us, the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. He goes before me. Defender behind me. 
defender behind me. Say, I won't fear. I won't fear. Say, I'm filled with anointing. I'm filled with anointing. My cup's overflowing. My cup's overflowing. No weapon can harm me. No weapon can harm me. I won't fear. I won't fear. People of God sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am not alone. Mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys. His joy is refreshing. His joy is refreshing. Restores, restores, restores my soul. My soul. Sing mercy and goodness. Mercy and goodness. Yes, it, it gives me a sure.
Lord. God, we worship you, Lord. Let us pray together, Spirit of the living God. We are with you this morning. You and I had a conversation about this morning. Speak now for thy servant is listening. Let the redeemed of the Lord say amen. Come on, somebody say praise the Lord. It's good to be in his presence uh, here today. Lift up before you today verse 1. Verse 1 of the 8th chapter. The gospel as recorded by John. The gospel as recorded by John. John chapter 8. The Bible says Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he came again unto the temple, into the temple, and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and when they which, and they which heard it, be, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. I've entitled this Intriguing. This Christological, this controversial pericope, get out of the gutter. Get out of the gutter. The title came to me this week as I prepared this sermon as a familiar quote even though it's by an unknown author, a quote I've known probably for 20, 25, maybe even 30 years now. Uh, it's pretty much close to my birth. It's pretty much close to my birth. <laughs> but uh, it's a quote that simply says that no man can hold another man in the gutter without remaining there himself. <laughs> No man can hold another man in the gutter without remaining there himself. It's very interesting because even in the church, 
Somehow the gutter makes its way inside. <laughs> Even in the church, there are some that wish to hold others in the gutter. <laughs> in the church, there are people that in essence would rather remind you every day of what you have done wrong without ever mentioning anything you've done right. <laughs> there are people in church that remember things you've done 10, 20, 30 years ago, but they forget that just two or three years ago you were baptized into the watery grave of baptism, and now you're a new creature, that you have made a change in your life, that the old things have passed away, and now you're a new creature. Some people would rather that you stay in the gutter. They don't want to let you out, so they spend all day trying to keep you there. And I stopped by here today to let you know that the leader of gutter conversation is the devil himself. The Bible says that he was the accuser of the brethren, and he accuses them day and night. And I need you to understand, for that reason, he got kicked out of heaven. Oh, because he was such an accuser of every, he got kicked out. And anybody that insists on being an accuser of the brethren, you're not going where the rest of us are. Oh, and I need somebody here to understand today that sometimes people have a whole lot to say about you. But the truth is, is that no one in church is perfect. Everybody in church has an issue. Everybody in church has something in their past that they're ashamed of. Now, the way some of them walk, you will never know. The way some of them talk, you could never grasp it. But if Jesus showed up and began writing in the dirt, everybody in church would have to vacate because the only person that is truly sinless and righteous is the man we call Jesus Christ. Understand, just because you have mastered your cover-up doesn't mean that Jesus cannot see your nakedness. You need to understand today that somehow, some way, your job is to lift up the brokenhearted, uh, to be a restorer to those who are struggling, uh, to be a friend uh, to the sinner, to let them know that Jesus still saves uh, and that if he saved you, he can save them too. It's an amazing thing. Sometimes in the house of God, we would rather keep on reminding people about the bad they have gone as if God never forgave you. The Bible says we were all sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. If Jesus didn't step in, none of you would be in church today. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Without redemption, none of us would be in church today. We can rejoice. But I need somebody here. You see, it's easy to be the one that's running your mouth. It's hard to be the one they're talking about. Oh, it's easy to have all the chatter going uh, when you are the one talking. But it's a whole different world when they're talking about you. And you've got to understand, for those of you that are on the negative side of somebody's venom, you need to understand that if you have confessed your sins, uh, that Jesus is faithful to forgive your sins. Uh, let those around you keep talking about you all they want. Uh, because where it matters most... Uh, they're not talking about it. Uh, he has wiped your slate clean. Uh, it's no longer up for discussion. He has kept, he has cast your sins uh, into the depths of the sea. Uh, and you've got to understand today that if they want to go deep sea diving, then let them go. Uh, keep your eyes uh, fixed on Jesus. Uh, keep your eyes uh, fixed on the Lord. Uh, Understand, uh, when they go deep sea diving, oftentimes they end up drowning. <laughs> because God has a way of redeeming you and dealing with your critics at the same time. 
That's why you turn it over to him. You don't try to fight that battle. And I know for some of you, it's hard to just walk in church on Sabbath morning knowing that everybody's talking about you. Yeah. It's hard to walk in church knowing that at Sabbath lunch, you're not going to be invited because you are the topic of lunch. And my challenge to you today is time for the people of God to get out the gutter. Amen. When I look and when the roll is cold up yonder and the saints are going home, I don't see where people are whispering to each other about how this person got here. I don't see conversations going on when I read the stories about how, can you believe her trifling self made it to glory? None at all. Everybody that's on the train to glory is shouting Hosanna, is shouting hallelujah because they've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. They're shouting hallelujah because they made it over. Anybody that makes it to glory knows uh, that if it had not been uh, for the Lord uh, on our side, uh, none of us would make it into glory. It's amazing that somehow you forget that Jesus picked you up when you were broken. Go say something bad about the person on Court Street like you've never been down that street. <laughs> going to talk about the people on 42nd as if you didn't used to have the problems that they have on 42nd. None of us are righteous. No, not one. Oh, help me out, help me out, help me out, help me out. Look at your neighbor, look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, that includes you. Bible says all have sinned fallen short of the glory of God. This is an amazing story because the disciples are kind of like spectators in this situation because it's the scribes and Pharisees that are working day and night to find a way to get rid of Jesus. And so this particular ploy that they come up with it's not just to trick Jesus, but it's also very degrading and immoral how they go about it. This story found here in John chapter 8, the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus uh, got the closest with, the one who understood his teachings the most, the one who mentions the word believe 93 times in the book. The theme of this book, all John wants you to do is to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and he is the redeemer of the world. And John here says that early in the morning, he came into the temple again and all the people came unto him and he sat down as one with authority and he taught them. Now it's interesting because Hmm. First of all, the Bible says the word actually used here is only used three times in Scripture. It says early in the morning, but actually properly translated, it's a word that means, in essence, he got there at dawn. Oh, Lord, help us. Now, I haven't been in a few weeks, so I feel kind of guilty pushing this, but, but, but he was at, if you would, he was at early morning prayer service. Oh, come on, somebody. He came to the early service. Makes me feel like I got to be here next week. I got to be here next week. But he came to the early morning service. He got there early and the saints got there early too because they were anxious to hear a word from him. Now it's interesting because he's not a scribe. He's not a Pharisee. Yet he sits down as one that has authority. See when you came to the temple, the guy who is the main event would sit down. Everybody else would gather around to hear what he had to say. Jesus sits down as one that has authority, even though he doesn't have a scribe badge, he ain't got a Pharisee hat, he ain't got nothing, but he just takes his seat. 
Now, you got to forgive him because it took him a long time, a whole 12 years, before he even got to visit his daddy's house. After he got there, he couldn't stay away. He was there every morning in his daddy's house teaching people about the love of Jesus Christ. It's interesting because the majority of people that came to him were the broken, the messed up, the people who everybody at church talked about were the people that hung out with Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus had a very bad reputation when he walked around earth. They said he hung out with drunkards, that he hung out with a bunch of wine biblers. Well, who else do you want him to hang out with? He came to redeem the lost. Understand that when people who are messed up come inside church on Sabbath morning, it's not for you to remind us of what they did 10, 20, 30 years ago. It's for you to stand on your feet feet and say what a mighty God we serve if he can deliver her then maybe he can deliver me too Oh, the reason you know their sins is because you used to participate in their sins. Uh, the reason you know what they're doing is because you used to do it too. You're just covering it up. Some of you are still doing it. And you've covered it up under the banner of being a deacon or an elder or an usher in the church. They're walking in here open, uh, broken, needing a savior. And instead of loving them, you despise them for the very sins you're committing yourself. It's an amazing thing because scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman taken in adultery. Yeah. When they set her in the midst, they said to the master, this woman was taken in adultery. We caught her in the very act. Anybody that comes to church, a group of men walking here, we caught her. In the very act, how in the world <laughs> were all of you <laughs> in the same place <laughs> at the same time <laughs> to catch her <laughs> in the very act? <laughs> it's very interesting because, <laughs> it's very interesting because Ellen White lets us know that in essence, it's actually them who have participated with her. <laughs> the ones bringing her in are the ones who were just intimate with her. <laughs> These are church folk, <laughs> Lord help us, <laughs> that just were intimate with the woman. <laughs> and now walking, they're saying, we've caught her <laughs> in the very act. <laughs> Here, here's the thing. Huh? They try to throw Jesus a curveball. <laughs> because if Jesus says set her free, then he's not obeying the law of Moses. Moses says she's supposed to be stoned. But if Jesus says stone her, then he's taking on the authority of the Romans, which means the Romans should come and arrest him and crucify him for giving a command that only Romans could give. So Jesus is there. But let me let you know, some of you have been trying for years to outsmart Jesus but you can't outsmart him. You've tried all kind of tricks. You've tried to cover stuff up. You've tried to hide things in the night season. And you know full well, you finally, if you did, at least you didn't know, you know now, that your God, your God, this is a secret. I'm going to tell you a secret. It's a very big secret. Your God still does not suffer from poor night vision. <laughs> In the night, he sees clear as day. There's nothing hidden from him. He knows everything. And they come. And it's amazing because now Jesus has to flip the script. If you want to roll with Moses, then let's roll with Moses. Moses' rule, his, his rule was not just that you bring the woman, but you also bring the man. <laughs> Well, you can't bring the man if you are the man. Oh, you can't find him because he is you. And so Jesus gets down and he starts writing. Huh? 
You know, and so in essence, da, 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 hold on a second, man. It's time. What are you going to do, Jesus? What are you going to do? And then Jesus says to them, he who is without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. And then he starts writing exactly what went on just a few minutes ago. And one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they begin to walk away. Now understand this, when you are broken and when you are in trouble, the best thing you can do is like this woman, fall at the feet of Jesus because Jesus will deliver you while he deals with your enemies. It's an amazing thing because these trifling leaders are there and they're trying to get this girl stoned. Now understand this. When the woman hears from Jesus, he who is without, without sin cast the first stone, she actually thinks she's about to get stoned. She's waiting for the first stone to hit. But then as she looks around, her accusers start disappearing. And I need you to understand that Jesus could walk into this place right now and start writing on the ground your sins. And so I need you to understand that you should never mistake the love of God in that God actually loves sinners. I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you to listen to this just, just for this quote. I need you to understand this. That in essence, in essence, Ellen White tells us the world had for this erring woman only contempt and scorn. But Jesus speaks words of comfort and hope. Amen. The sinless one pities the weakest, the weakness of the sinner and reaches to her a helping hand. While the hypocritical Pharisee denounce, Jesus bids her go and sin no more. Amen. It is not Christ's follower. Listen to it. In other words, it's saying here, Christ's followers don't act like this. With averted eyes, turning from the erring, leaving them unhindered to pursue their downward course. But rather, those who are forward in accusing others and zealous in bringing them to justice are often in their own lives more guilty than the ones they accuse. Men hate the sinner while they love the sin. Christ hates the sin but loves the sinner. Amen. And he says that this will be the spirit of all who follow him. Christian love is slow to censure, quick to discern penitence, ready to forgive, to encourage, to set the wanderer in the path of holiness and stay his feet therein. Amen. Jesus restores. Amen. God restores the sinner. There are some of you here today that need restoration from God. And I, learned, I just want you to know today, despite the people around you, despite the fact that there are a few in the crowd that are too pious to admit their sins, you need to understand today that on this dreary Sabbath afternoon that God brought you into this house that you might be delivered from your sins. He brought you into the right place at the right time that you might be made whole. Don't worry about people around you. If they insist on accusing you, then remember they're not headed where you're planning to go. Accusers will burn in hell. It's amazing because we find here not just the grace of God, but the redemption of God. God never excuses her sin. 
he tells her, as a matter of fact, go and sin no more. We don't condone sin in church, but we work with the sinner that they might be redeemed. <laughs> we don't come to destroy sinners. Jesus came that they might have life. <laughs> we don't come into church to speak bad about others. As my mom used to always say, if you ain't got nothing nice to say, then don't say nothing at all. Very poor grammar, but that's what it was. If you ain't got nothing good to say, then don't say nothing at all. Learn to keep your big mouth shut. The last thing we, we need to hear from is you tearing down somebody else while you continue in your sins. Your problem, why you keep focusing and knowing everybody else's problems, is because uh, you are ignoring your own problems. If you spent more time focused on fixing you, you wouldn't have time to talk bad about anybody else. There are people that don't feel worthy to come into God's house because they're afraid of what you might say about them if they walk in. As if you have a heaven to give them and a hell to keep them from. No one in here gets to escape the judgment. Everybody will be brought to the judgment with every work and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We are all equal at the foot of the cross. And if somebody else wants to get to the cross, there's always more room at the feet of Jesus Christ. How dare you act as if somehow because you have been here so long that there's no longer room for anybody else. Understand the, the heart and the mind of the true believer in Christ says that all are welcome at the cross. Whomsoever will, let them come. Jesus loves everybody. It's an amazing thing because oftentimes in church, people are hurt. They're hurt so bad that to come to church makes them cry. Just to be sitting here makes them weep. Today, I want to challenge you as the believers of Christ, perhaps even as the accusers of the brethren, but I also want to speak to the accused and let you know that there's still a balm in Gilead <laughs> that heals the sin-sick soul, that Jesus loves you and that Jesus will restore you. And in heaven, the way that they overcame the devil, the great accuser, was by the blood of the lamb. By the blood of the lamb. And so today, as our organist comes, we play this I, I need you to understand today that Jesus loves you just the way you are. Jesus loves you just the way you are. Jesus accepts you just the way you are. Now, I got to promise you, once you come to him, he won't leave you the same way you are. But, but right now, he accepts you just the way you are. God doesn't need you to fix yourself before you come to him. Jesus says, when you come to me, I will fix you. You can't fix yourself. All you need to do is come. If you will just come to me, I will fix whatever's going on in your life. So your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Somebody here today needs to be fixed. Someone in church today needs a savior. Someone needs Jesus to restore Someone 
is messed up and broken and needs to hear from Jesus that he still cares enough that he still loves them enough to save them. So today, if that is you, I want to start with you first. I need to if you, if you, you need just to want Jesus to deliver you, you're tired. You're tired. Things are so rough right now. Your nerves are shot. Don't know what to do with yourself. But today, Jesus says, I can give you a brand new start. I can fix it. Just give me a chance. I'll fix it for you. Give me a chance. And I'll restore you. I'll make you over a new. If that's you today, just stand. Stand to your feet. Wherever you are, just stand, 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 stand. I want you to come. Today, I want to, I want to get close and pray with you. Stand. Come on down here to the front. God bless you guys. Is there another? Just stand. God bless you. Stand. Come. Come. Whomsoever will. Let them come. You're broken and you need to be fixed today. Come. Whomsoever will, let them come. Wherever you are, just come. Stand on your feet. Come on, church. Pray for them. People are coming. These are the times when those who are broken need somebody to put their arms around them and let them know that Jesus loves them. That Jesus saves them. That God restores them. That God loves them just the way they are. Oh, is there another? Is there another today? It's an amazing thing because it's so easy to forget. It's so easy to forget all the things that God has delivered you from. But God says, today I can give you a new start. Is there another? Just stand to your feet. Is there another? Just come. Whomsoever will, let them come. Is there another? Is there another? Just come. Yes, put your arms around them. Put your arms around them. Can we praise God, church? It's a beautiful thing. They're come. Is there another? Even up in the balcony, is there another? Let them know. Let them know that Jesus loves them. Let them know that he can deliver them. Let them know that there's nothing that God cannot fix. Is there somebody else? Somebody else want to give their heart to Jesus? I see a hand raised. I see some hands raised. Is there somebody else that needs to get up out of their seat and say, Jesus, I'm giving it all to you today. I surrender my life to you today. I need for you to step inside and do something. If that's you, just stand. Wherever you are, stand to your feet and come on down. Oh, God bless you today. Come on down. Don't be afraid. Even the balcony, don't be afraid. Jesus is waiting to put his arms around you. Then my second appeal is to the community of faith. If you're willing to say to those that have come forth that I refuse to be an accuser, but I want to be a person that lifts you up. I don't want to talk bad about you. I want to speak life into you. I don't want to be a destroyer. I want to be someone who builds you up. If that's you, church family, just stand to your feet wherever you are. If that's you today, just want to say, I'm here for you. I'll lift you up. I'll carry your burdens up. When you fall, I'll be there to strengthen you. When you're struggling, I'll be there to carry you. With words from my mouth, I need you. This is the God we serve. It is. I need you. I need you. I need you to survive. I need you. I need you. I love you. I need you to Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Father in heaven, Lord, we're thankful for these souls that have come down here to the altar of grace. We're thankful for their decision to surrender to you today. They're begging for a fresh start in Jesus Christ. 
They can't do that without Jesus. Jesus, come even now and wrap your arms around them. Let them know that you love them more than life itself, so much so that you gave uh, your own life so that they could have this opportunity, this moment, to start over afresh with you. God, there are some even in the audience who are members of this community of faith that also need a fresh start. For whatever reason, they didn't feel comfortable coming down. But Jesus, I beg that you would bring deliverance to their life. That as they fall on their feet before you, that you would look with them with the same pity, the same love, the same kindness that you did that woman. And not just deliver them, but give them the power to go and to sin no more. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. Keep these ones that have made this decision until the day of your coming when we shall hear the, the voice of God, the sound of the trumpet. And not just will the dead in Christ rise first, but, but we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet you in the clouds. We will be with you throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. God, keep us to that day, we pray. In Jesus' name, let the redeemed of the Lord say amen. Come on, somebody say amen again. Somebody say praise the Lord today. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. God bless you. Send for a closing hymn, song, chorus, Love Lifted Me.
bow heads for the benediction. And now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. song says just want to thank you just want to praise you as you go go and tell somebody about the good news that you heard today feel free to be ushered out and be seated as you please just just want to praise you forever and ever and ever Blessings, 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 blessings.
Jesus! 